So I have a question for you. Have you ever seen someone outside of the place you normally see them, and you have to pause to think a second, to think through why it is that you know them? Maybe they work, at, work out at the same gym as you. Maybe they're employed at a store that you frequent. And then you see them at a local restaurant, and you might smile and say hi, but it takes you a second to put the pieces together why their faces look so familiar. Seeing someone outside of the habitat that is familiar to you gives you a different perspective of who they are. Maybe they're busting some serious reps at the gym, but at the restaurant, they're enjoying a double burger and fries. Maybe they're the most helpful person in the store, and then you see them enjoying a meal and laughing with their family around the restaurant table, and it all makes sense why they exhibit such kindness at their job. When I was a kid navigating grade school, it was the mid to late 1980s. And one of the most anticipated things was reaching your sixth grade year. Not only were you top dog in the school, but you finally got Mr. D for a teacher. His name was really Mr. Davidovich, but that didn't roll off the tongue quite as easily as Mr. D. And Mr. D was cool. He was the tallest man that I had ever seen at that point. And that says a lot, because clearly I come from some tall genes. He had red hair, which was also somewhat rare, and he was just the kindest guy. Now, this was a super long time ago, so the rules and regulations that schools had to follow for safety procedures were significantly different than they are now. Uh, but one day in the fall, myself and two friends were selected to go with Mr. D to pick out pumpkins for a class project. And not only did we get to eat lunch at McDonald's, but we also got to drive in Mr. D's personal car. And that was huge. He drove a brown, sporty Saab. And as we took off, he put the windows down and he turned the radio up. And once we got over the shock that he was singing out loud, we joined him. We saw him interact with the salespeople selling the pumpkins and the workers at McDonald's. And as I watched him move around the outside world, his teacher mask fell off. And underneath, it turns out, he was human. And he was cooler than ever. This interaction completely impacted me. I remember it all these years later because it was the first time that I was truly aware that teachers were normal people. And that was mysteriously fascinating. Now, as we look at the text for today, that is what we are going to experience with Jesus just in the opposite way. Where so far we have seen him in human form doing remarkably non-human things, However, we will have the curtain pulled back and this remarkable opportunity to see what Jesus is like when he is at home. Eavesdrop, if you will, on the conversation that takes place in the most holy of spaces with Jesus the Son and God the Father. Chapter 17 is truly the most unique of all of the chapters in Scripture, and I realize that's a pretty bold statement to make, but it's true. Because this chapter gives us an inside look at Jesus' relationship with the Father in a way that is not seen anywhere else. And in this chapter, Jesus is demonstrating something to us, something significantly important, which is the need for prayer. And I think it's fabulous that we are just coming into that after our prayers this morning. This is a model for the power of prayer from someone that we might not even think needed to pray because of who he is. Jesus is the Son of God. He is sovereign over all things. He is ruler over all things, creator of all things, and knows all things. And yet he is in a position of being dependent on God. Jesus in his perfection and in his righteousness, but also in his incarnation, was dependent on the Father to fulfill his word. 
He is showing us the intimate communication that he has with his father, but he's also setting an example for us through his actions that we should do the same thing. It's not that this is the first time that Jesus prayed. I mean, clearly that is not the case. He prayed throughout his entire time on earth, and we have countless examples of that throughout the Gospels. He was in constant communication with the Father. However, very rare are the words that Jesus prayed recorded. We know that he did pray, but we just don't always know what he, what he said. Now, some of the noted places are at his baptism and when he began his public ministry. In Mark 1, it says he rose before dawn and went out to a solitary place and prayed. When he was about to choose the disciples in the Gospel of Luke, it says he went to a mountain and prayed, and he prayed all throughout the night. In Luke 9, while he was in prayer, he was transfigured. He prayed at the tomb of Lazarus. It says he prayed to the Father and then said, Lazarus, get out. On the cross he prayed, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he asked the Father to forgive those who had done this to him, stating, they don't know what they're doing. Where these brief but powerful prayers from Jesus to his Father are recorded. Chapter 17, however, is the longest recorded prayer of Jesus's, where every word comes directly from his own lips and spans for 26 verses. It has been described as a thunderbolt fallen from the sky, a prayer above all prayers. And today we're going to take a look at the first five verses. So John 17, verses 1 through 5. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. See, Jesus is transitioning from his time with the disciples. That was the previous four chapters that we walked through. And he is now spending one-on-one -on -one time with his father. And it's entirely possible that the disciples are still around, that they're hearing him, but they're no longer the focus of the conversation. And he is going to his father, and he is asking that he will fulfill all of the promises that he made that the Father would bring to fulfillment all the work that he has done. A remarkable prayer demonstrating the humiliation of Jesus in a unique way. He is God, who in John 1, 3 says, Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made. And Hebrews 1, 3, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Jesus is the creator and sustainer of the universe. However, in his incarnation, his coming to earth, he set those things aside to become flesh for us. And in so doing, he is now submitting to the Father and asking that he fulfill everything he has promised. This prayer marks the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. But it also looks forward to what followed after, which is his heavenly ministry. Jesus' work was clearly not done. What he was positioned to do after he filled, fulfilled his time on earth, which is to intercede for his people at the very throne of God. And this prayer is the perfect representation of what Jesus is doing right now for each of us. This one chapter in all of scriptures that gives us a glimpse of Jesus right now. Have you ever wondered what he's doing? What his day looks like? He's communicating. He's interceding on our behalf. And I think that is 
pretty awesome and remarkably humbling. This prayer is divided into three parts. In the first five verses, which we just read, are Jesus praying for himself. And beginning in verse 6, he prays for the disciples who were with him on that very night. And he closes the prayer by praying for all believers through all time. He begins by praying for his own glory, and he ends by praying for the glory of his people. Five verses for him, and the rest essentially are for us. It is Jesus' intercession for us that is the reason that we will never be separated from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, in Matthew 6, we have another recorded prayer entitled, The Lord's Prayer. What about that one, right? I mean, that is a pretty awesome prayer, and it is. And this prayer came out of the disciples asking Jesus how they should pray. And he responded, pray this way, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. But this is not the prayer that Jesus prayed. In all truth, he couldn't have prayed that prayer. Why? Because that prayer in part says, forgive us our trespasses, forgive us our sins. Jesus would have had no reason to ask the Father's forgiveness for anything. Matthew 6 is the Lord's prayer for us, and John 17 is the Lord praying. Simple words that are filled with incomparable majesty and profound mystery. Us seeing Jesus in his rightful habitat with the curtain fold back, pouring his heart out to his dad. The only words that are not Jesus's come at the very beginning. It says, after Jesus said this, which is the final verse that we looked at last week, John 16, where he said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. He then looked toward heaven and prayed. Think about the typical stance that we take when we pray. We tend to bow our heads, right? But Jesus is looking up. And in looking up, there is a confidence that comes, an expectation in his positioning. He's making eye contact with his father. And he is trusting completely that what he is asking will come to pass. Now, when we look at how Jesus addresses God, it is interesting of all the names that could have been chosen out of all of the descriptive words that could have been communicated about their relationship, the words chosen are father and son, the first member of the Trinity to the second. It makes sense. I mean, it communicates a shared nature, right? But it's more than that. There is an intimate familiarity. It speaks to the fact that not only was Jesus one in nature with God, but he was also one in relationship with God. A relationship that is full of love and care, a father to his son, a son to his father, immeasurably more. Also God's delight and treasure. And in this prayer, Jesus is asking that his personal will would conform to God's will. He does that also in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, if there is any way, take this cup from me. Because in that time, taking the cup was a symbol of participation. Think about what Jesus is saying. He's saying, if there is any way for me not to participate in what's to come, please take the cup. But immediately after he says that, he follows with, but no, it's for this very hour, for this very purpose that I came. Not my will, but yours be done. Jesus conforms to what he wants in that moment of feeling overwhelmed with what he will endure, and he submits that to God. So with that in mind, what are we like when we pray? What draws us to pray? Maybe we're in conflict over a situation. We're facing difficult circumstances. There's something that we're seeking. And that is all fair and good. He tells us to come to him, to release our burden and take up his because his is significantly 
lighter than ours. Maybe we reach out in a last-ditch effort to see if we can convince God to use his power to fit our desires. If you get me through this, I will never do that again, sort of thing. I would be lying if I said I have never wondered if prayer matters. What difference does it make? Does God hear me? Does he care? And I can't tell you how many times I have prayed very similar to the example I just gave. God, if you get me through this, I will never do that again. If you show me grace here, I'll never make such a stupid decision again. If you protect me here, I will turn a new leaf. I promise. The reality is all of those prayers were 1,000% for my benefit, for my perceived well-being and peace of mind, maybe even to avoid a deserved consequence. But the reality is I and my humanness and my sinfulness was never capable of living up to the prayers that I prayed. Just get me through and I'll never do it again. I mean, sure, I can hold up my end of the bargain for a while, maybe a day or two, a month or two, an hour or two. But my struggle in my praying was that it was all centered on me and nothing about God there at all, his will, his purpose, his best. So my continued failure or lack of follow-through left me feeling disappointed in God, like somehow he was to blame for not holding up his end of the bargain. But when I lay those things at his feet, and I say, I can't take it anymore. I can't surrender these things. I can't come up with a creative way to make you see it my way. When I give it to God and ask him, do what only you can do with this, that's when he can begin his work in me. And that's where he still begins his work in me because I find myself there over and over again. Do I like it when that happens? Not really. Do I feel great? Negatory. But am I becoming more dependent on God? Does my heart begin to transform? Do those areas of struggle fade away? Yes, only because I'm surrendering to the power of Christ in me and allowing him to do the work in me and seeking his will through me. Not me throwing out bargaining chips because it turns out I'm not too good at bargaining. Does prayer matter? Absolutely. However, it does not always manifest in the way that we expect, but it transforms us from the inside out. And as we seek God's will above our own, where we see him through what we are asking, that's what Jesus is doing here. He is surrendering his will to God's perfect will. Think about the three pillars of a healthy relationship. You have respect and trust and communication. And prayer enhances all of those things when done in accordance to the will of God and not our own. Jesus knows what he is about to do, and he is seeking God's perfect will in that, even though the answer to that prayer still comes through his death on the cross. Revelations 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's giving us a word picture. Hello? Are you there? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Now, this verse has been used in many situations to bring people to faith in Jesus, which is awesome. You become a follower of Christ by inviting him into your life, by receiving him, who he is, into your life with the desire of becoming more like him, which is wonderful and completely appropriate. However, what's interesting is that in the context of the verse, we find that the people that it is actually being spoken to is the church. 
to believers. Why would God be knocking on their door asking to come in? Isn't he already there? He explains what he means in the next sentence. He says, I want to come and eat with you. Back in this time period, to make this statement would mean something far more significant than eating a burger together in your backyard. It was a statement that shows a desire for a closer relationship, meaning, I want to share experiences with you, share my life with you. I want to be in your home, and I want you to be in mine so that we can grow together. Think about when you have a new neighbor, and maybe this doesn't happen so much anymore, but I think we should bring it back. But when someone new moved into the neighborhood, those living around them would bring them something to welcome them. Now, when Chris and I moved onto our street, our neighbor across the street yelled from his front step what color shutters he thought that we should pick because he was the one who had to look at them. (laughs) We did go with his choice, by the way, but that's not the kind of welcome I'm talking about. I'm talking about a baked good, right? Maybe a casserole. And when you went to drop it off, you didn't expect to sit down with them and eat it. That would be weird. You just wanted to make an introduction and extend a welcome from the outside. And that's great at first, but what this passage is saying is, hey, I don't want to just get to know you from the front porch of your life. I want to be welcomed in so that we can spend time together relaxing, letting our guard down, lowering the walls of protection we have built up. I have a friend whose home I have been at a lot over the past several weeks for a variety of reasons. And at one point when I showed up, I was like, hey, I almost brought my toothbrush and my PJs. And I was joking, kind of, because I was there again and I was going to be there again the next day. And it really would have made more sense for me to just spend the night than go home and come back again. But I think about that in this context. Jesus doesn't want us to just open the door to him to grab the good stuff, the baked goods and the casseroles of life. He wants to arrive at the door with his holy toothbrush and PJs because he knows he's going to be invited in to stay for a really long time. Jesus is speaking to believers. He's knocking and asking to come in, come into the everyday nuances of our lives, come into the clutter of dirty dishes and messy rooms. He wants to be invited in through the way that we communicate with him and the respect and the trust we have for him. And if we're struggling with opening the door to those parts of our lives, he wants to show us that he is worthy to take root on the couch of those places. So that meal by meal, we trust him more, we respect him more, we talk with him more, and in so doing, become more like him. And in this prayer, we see the depth of relationship that Jesus has with the Father. Jesus sees prayer as food, as his source of nutrients and strength. Do we see prayer that way, or do we view it more like a supplement, like I'm low on vitamin D? So I'm pretty good in most other areas, but I'm going to take this little supplement to enhance that spot. God, you can leave me alone where everything else is good. I just need you to fix this. God to Jesus is his complete dependence on his spiritual life. And as Jesus continues, his prayer might seem selfish. He says, glorify me right? But should we think that's selfish, we have to remember that we're looking at that from a fallen world perspective. We know that we would never have the right to go before God and say, hey, glorify me the way I was yesterday, because that was so much better than today. So it might seem odd that Jesus would be focused on himself in that way. However, we also can't fully comprehend what Jesus gave up what he surrendered over to become what he became on our behalf, God becoming man. So what he is asking, it's not prideful or selfish. He is asking for what is rightly his, to get back what he gave up for us. But even still, it's not for him. 
What does he say right after? Glorify me so that I may glorify you. Through what I'm called to do, may the world see your glory. Not mine. That glory was his too. But it's not for his. It's for God's. Father, the time has come. Throughout the gospel, Jesus has said, the hour has not yet come. The hour has not yet come. He continually pointed to the fact that it was not the right time. But now the hour has come, the hour where two eternities would meet. Eternity past and eternity future. And they would meet on the cross, becoming sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The hour that fulfilled the divine design, dismissing the old nature and law, and ushering in all that God had promised, becoming accessible in an amazing way because of Jesus. And Jesus is praying with such certainty in what he is called to do. He is acknowledging that this crucial moment in all of history is now upon him. There is a study on the great prayers of the Bible, and the thing that the prayers all have in common is this one request. God, show us your glory. One of the quotes in the study is as follows. Prayer is beyond any question the highest activity of the human soul. Man is at his greatest and highest when upon his knees he comes face to face with God. When a man is authentically speaking to God, he is at his very acme. Now, I'm not super smart, so I had to Google acme. And acme means at his best, at his most successful place. It's the highest activity of the human soul, and therefore, it is at the same time the ultimate test of a man's spiritual condition. There is nothing that tells the truth about us as a people so much as our prayer life. Everything we do in the Christian life is easier than prayer. Think about that. I can think of a lot of really hard things <laughs> that seem more challenging than prayer but I don't think that that's true. Before we begin to think of ourselves and our own needs, even before our concern for others, we must start with this great concern about God and his honor and his glory. There is no principle in connection with the Christian life that exceeds this in importance. And that is what Jesus is praying for here. God above all else, Above my circumstances, above my wants, above my fear, above my confusion, above what I can see, above what I can gain, may your glory be made known through me. That is a powerful, life-changing way to pray. Paul says in Ephesians 3, 14 through 20, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of Christ's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we, more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen that they would see the glory of God's love. When this happens, when this becomes our prayer, when we ask to have God's glory shine bright through our circumstances, we begin to see him in every aspect of our life, in the exciting, in the mundane, in the joys and in the sorrows. Even though this probably isn't a conscious thought, oftentimes by the way we pray, we are asking God to make our glory shown. 
We're so inwardly focused that we go to God for something from him and not for God himself. We don't really want him as much as we want what he can do. True surrender will always go beyond what comes natural to us. It's the kind of surrender that desires that God be seen above and beyond what that might mean for us. Because when we want the person of Jesus more than the gifts of Jesus, the characteristics of Jesus will transform us. Jesus is saying, God, show your glory through my death on the cross. Now, how does the cross bring glory to God? Verses 2 and 3, the death of Jesus reveals God's sovereignty and his authority. And through the resurrection of Jesus, the glory of God's power is revealed and echoes through all of time the glory of God's love. Because when all looked lost, he was in total control. And not only was he in complete control, but the greatest gift that could ever be given was given at that time. A gift for those who believe, which is eternal life. And Jesus speaks this prayer in such a way with a tense in speech that shows that what he is communicating will happen. And he concludes in verse 5, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. And if we're struggling to understand what he gave up for us, consider this. When Jesus was dying on the cross, he cried out in a very significant way. Matthew 27, 46 says about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the only time when Jesus refers to his Father as God. Because in this moment, he was cut off from his Father. And he was surrendering every ounce of his glory and his deity through his pain and humiliation on the cross. He wasn't able to address him as Father. He had given that nature and that relationship up. He was speaking in complete humility and surrender to God giving up all he had, every title, every benefit of those titles. And he handed it over. Why? For us. He surrendered all he had for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it is so humbling to come before this table every week. It's so hard to really understand what it was like for you to give up what you had. We don't understand what it was like to be filled with God's glory, to be deity, to be part of the creation of everything and yet come to earth in such humiliation for us. Thank you for following through. Thank you for not letting fear overtake what you had to have been feeling. Lord, we just thank you for your love so that we have the opportunity to be redeemed and be restored because of your work on the cross, because of your sacrifice for us. Thank you for paving the way, not only by how you lived, but also by how you prayed. Thank you for giving us this glimpse behind the curtain of what it is like in communication with Jesus the Son and God the Father. Lord, you tell us to come boldly. You tell us to come persistently. You care about the things that we carry in a way that we cannot comprehend. And there is nothing that is too embarrassing or too shameful or too far gone for your work on the cross to have already covered. 
for all that you have done. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.